Hi, and welcome to another Kerbal Space Program tutorial. This time I'm going to show you how to get into orbit using relatively basic parts from Kerbal Space Program. The kind of parts that you can unlock very early in either a science game or a career mode game. So we're going to start with our Mark 1 command pod. So this is the very first command pod you unlock. It's unlocked by standard, default. Uh, we are going to add a parachute to it. So I am doing this in sandbox mode, but all of these parts that I'm using you should be able to unlock either right away or very soon after you start just by doing a little bit of science. So we're going to go with a Mark 16 parachute. Put that on the top. This is very important. If you do not have a parachute, your Kerbal will die. Alright. Next we are going to add a heat shield. A 1.25 meter heat shield. Now, it's possible you might be able to get away with this mission without the heat shield, but it's much safer to take it, so I recommend using the heat shield. Have a stack decoupler. Now, it's very important that this stack decoupler be on a separate stage from your parachute. If they are on the same stage like this, your parachute will burn up when you release this up in the upper atmosphere, or even above the atmosphere and then your Kerbal will die. So keep them in separate stages with the parachute on the last stage. So to build the actual rocket part of our upper stage, I'm going to use two FLT-400 fuel tanks. Right. And then I'm going to use the LV-909 Terrier liquid fuel engine. Now this engine has a relatively low thrust, but a very high specific impulse, so it's very fuel efficient. I'm doing that because I want to make sure that I have extra fuel when I get up towards orbit because if you're doing this you may make some mistakes and have a less efficient trajectory than I will even though my trajectory is not going to be very efficient and having extra fuel can help save you from that so we're gonna have another stack decoupler and then another couple fuel tanks, but I'm going to get rid of the, this here, replace it with the LV T45 Swivel Liquid Fuel Engine. So this has a much higher thrust than the uh, other liquid fuel engine that we used earlier, but it also has a much lower specific impulse, so it's going to drain through this fuel much faster. So to help us get off of the platform, we are also going to have a couple of solid rocket boosters. But first, we're going to need to add some radial decouplers. I'm going to turn on angle snap to make this easier for me. And two times radial symmetry. You've got one on either side. I'm going to go with the RT10 Hammer Solid Fuel Booster. So after you attach this, it's pretty important to check to make sure it's on the radial decoupler. It's very easy to accidentally attach it to this fuel tank here. And if that's the case, you won't actually be able to to detach these rockets. I'm also going to add a nose cone. So the nose cone isn't entirely necessary, but it will greatly improve your aerodynamics. So I highly recommend it. Next I'm going to use some AVR8 winglets. These will help me control my rocket while it's still in the atmosphere. It will add a lot of stability and control. Now, winglets, of course, will not work once you get up into space so there's very little point in putting them on rocket stages that will be in orbit when they're used. So I'm going to put this in four times symmetry, so that way I have four. For many rockets you can get away with only three of these and using three times symmetry, but because I have two of these rockets, solid fuel boosters, I'm using four times symmetry so that they, neither of these will intersect or come too close to the winglets. Now before I had them a little bit off center, and so I just adjusted them so that now they're dead center between these rocket boosters. Alright, that's it for assembly. The only other thing I'm going to do is move around my staging. Now staging is really important. Messing up on your staging is the result is the reason for, I would say, probably most uh, spaceship failures. It's the reason why most of my spaceships fail the first time around. So, I'm going to drop this into the first stage. Now this is my bottom liquid fuel engine. 
And then, just to make things easier for myself, I'm going to put my upper stage engine on the same stage as the decoupler directly below it. You don't have to do this. If you don't, you just hit the spacebar twice. I'm just doing it to make things a little bit easier for myself. Alright, now I'm going to launch. So, for most launches, you'd probably want to put your thrust all the way to 100%, but that isn't really necessary for this launch, because for our first stage, we have these solid rocket boosters that will help. So I'm going to leave it at 50%, and I'm going to hit T to turn on my stability assist. And I've got Jebediah Kerman. It's important that you use a pilot here. It doesn't have to be Jebediah. Valentina will do just fine as well. But don't use Bob or Bill, because they will not be able to use the stability assist, even though this light will come on, and it will pretend that you have stability assist. So now I'm going to hit spacebar and engage my first stage. Now, while these solid rocket boosters are going, I'm not really going to start my turn at all. I'm just going to go pretty much straight up. And then as they run out of fuel, I will decouple them and then throttle all the way up to 100. Here we go, 100% thrust on my bottom stage. Now I'm starting a little bit of a turn. Now, my rocket is very stable, so it wants to resist my turn and go back to a straight up and down configuration. Hitting M to go over to the map and expanding my nav ball here. Zoom in. Now, I'm actually probably going to fly most of this flight from the nav ball. It's easier to see where you're going. The only disadvantage is you can't stage from here. So that's why I'm turning on the resources by left clicking on this little gas can symbol so I can keep track of my liquid fuel and oxidizer because as they start to drop I'm going to have to uh, stage again. So notice I'm keeping this turn so that I keep tilting more towards the horizon. This is called a gravity turn and it will start bringing the edge of this orbit which is actually a suborbit right now out. And there we go, time to stage. And My spacecraft is actually much more controllable and I'm going to put it to a much steeper angle. Now, as you go up through the atmosphere, the amount of energy that you lose from going away from your prograde marker, which is this yellow marker, starts to go down as the atmosphere thins out. Which means you can use steeper angles. So here I'm really flattening out. I'm at 90 degrees. And I'm watching my apoapsis. I want this to go above 70,000, because 70,000 is the cutoff for Kerbin's atmosphere. Above 70,000, there is zero air resistance, which isn't really physically accurate. Actual real-world atmospheres just kind of fade out slowly as you go up, and they never really have some hard limit. But this is a video game, and Kerbin has a hard limit. So now that I'm above 70,000 in my apoapsis, I'm actually going to flatten all the way out to my horizon. Now, for most rockets, I wouldn't do that. I would actually cut my thrust, go up to about here, then go to the horizon and thrust again. But because I'm using this relatively low thrust engine, I actually don't have enough thrust to do that, which is why I'm very early on flattening out. And that is okay because I'm so high in the atmosphere that there's almost no air resistance pushing against me. So you can see that my time to apoapsis, T minus 51, 50, is going down. Generally speaking, that's not a great thing, but with this rocket it's fine because I'm far enough away, I have plenty of fuel that I will make it to orbit even with a decreasing time to apoapsis. Um, when you start building bigger rockets with more fuel, more stages, more solid rocket boosters, even liquid fuel boosters, you want to try and make sure that your time to apoapsis is going up really until you enter orbit. It's probably the safest way to do that but for this particular craft it's not necessary at all. So I'm just going to keep pointing myself roughly at the horizon until I start to get a periapsis. And so your apoapsis is the farthest point in your orbit from the well, body you're orbiting. Your periapsis is the closest point. So at first it will start at basically zero and then it will start moving up away from Kerbin. And my goal is basically to just get it above 70,000. Once it's above 70,000, that's it. I'm in orbit. 
So here it comes. Alright, so now I'm actually going to shut my thrust down, because I want to save a little bit of fuel. Although really, I have plenty of fuel. I'm just going to get a little bit closer to my apoapsis. So I'm going to use time acceleration. Alright. Go back to my prograde vector marker. And throttle up a bit. Now the reason I go back to the apoapsis is because that's a slight, it's a somewhat more efficient way to do this burn. Well, there we go. I'm at 79,000 meters here. 101,000 meters here. So this is a stable orbit. It will continue around Kerbin for as long as you let the game run. You can leave the game and come back and it will still orbit. So at this point, I have successfully reached orbit. So my next step is to come back to Kerbin safely. So in order to come back to Kerbin, the obvious thing to do would probably just be to point towards the ground and fire your rocket. And if you have enough fuel, you can do that. But orbital mechanics are a little bit more complicated than that. To get where you're going, you don't just point at your destination and fire your rockets most of the time. In this case, what I'm actually going to do is, right about now, I'm going to flip around so that I'm facing directly backwards, or retrograde. This is my retrograde marker. And I'm going to fire until I drop below about 35,000 on my apoapsis. Sorry, on my periapsis. So I'm going to throttle up a bit. Now don't throttle up all the way because you'll probably drop your periapsis too fast that way. So there we go. I'm a little bit below 33,000. That's fine. So I'm going to time accelerate again. Now time acceleration will stop when you drop below 70,000 meters, because it can, will go from normal time acceleration, which basically just doesn't run a physics simulation, to physical time acceleration, which does run a physics simulation. Alright. Find my retrograde marker again. So for re-entry, you're going to want to point retrograde for basically the entire time, because your heat shield is on the bottom of your ship, and you want your bottom of the ship to be fa facing the direction that you're traveling. So, I could slow down more using my rocket, which you can't really see because it's too dark, but I don't want to. I'm just going to stage. So there we go. There's my lower stage. And now I'm going to use physical time acceleration while I'm still high up in the atmosphere, which is fine. There's the sunrise over Kerbin. And you can see my heat shield now illuminated by the sun. Alright, so I'm coming out of time acceleration to readjust my trajectory a little bit, get myself back on this retrograde marker. Um, you can steer in time acceleration, but it greatly amplifies the effects of all your keystrokes, so it's not a very good idea. Um, if you have a very stable lander or rover, actually really just rover, you can kind of steer that in time acceleration, but even that's pretty dangerous. I recommend not trying to control any craft in time acceleration if you don't have to. So going back to time acceleration until I start getting some re-entry effects. So you'll see that my atmosphere marker is moving down into higher pressure levels. Now I'm at the point where atmospheric effects are actually going to start being pretty significant. I'm starting to drift a lot away from my retrograde marker, so I'm going to come back onto it. Now, right now I'm still in orbit mode, but I can click to switch to surface mode to see how fast I'm re moving relative to the surface of Kerbin. That's useful for a lot of things if you're going to land, especially if you're landing on, say, Moon or Minmus, because sometimes it won't switch to surface as soon as you'd like, and so you're using the wrong retrograde or prograde marker. So, for instance, Right now, you can see as I switch between orbit and surface, there's a slight change in the location of my retrograde marker. In some cases, that can actually be a much more significant change. And so you want to make sure you're in the right mode. For most activities, the game will actually put you in the right mode automatically. So I'm going to turn off stability, because right now, aerodynamic stability will actually keep me pointed in the retrograde direction more effectively 
than stability assist, which tries to keep me in the same kind of objective direction with reference to, I guess, the solar system as a whole. So, in this case, it's actually easier to turn stability assist off as I re-enter. So here I go. Now at some point you'll start seeing this ablator number go down, assuming that I'm going fast enough, which it looks like I am. Once that, If that were to reach zero, which it won't, then your heat shield would no longer have any effect and the heating would start to take place on the actual crew cabin, which could cause the crew cabin to explode if it gets too hot. Um, one thing that's important is right now there is a memory leak in Kerbal Space Program, and if you see little temperature bars pop up on your spaceship, it's very important to turn them off or your game will crash. Just hit F10 and it'll go away. None of these should pop up with this craft because the heat shield should take all of that heat, but in many other spacecraft you will see that on re-entry or even sometimes on takeoff if you're going very fast on takeoff. So just as soon as you see it, disable it or your game will crash. And now you can see my ablator is going down 193 from its original 200 which means that my heat shield is working. Now, at this point, if I hadn't... if I had left this parachute in the same stage as the decoupler below this heat shield, my parachute would have already been destroyed, and Jebediah would be doomed. But as it is, he is on track for a safe touchdown. Or, well, splashdown. Now, because this is a very simple craft, just a capsule, basically, it can really land anywhere on Kerbin safely. But for larger, more complex craft, you're going to want to try and set yourself down over land. And as you practice re-entry, you'll get better at aiming where you're going to land. So don't worry about that too much. But now that I'm dropping below 300 meters per second, I can start deploying my parachute to slow myself down. Uh, at about 300 meters per second, you're going about Mach 1, and at that point it's very unsafe to deploy your parachute. It will probably just rip off of your spacecraft and then you'll die. So wait until you're going relatively slow before you use the parachute. Now it's time for some time acceleration, just so I get down to the surface quicker. Right now, because I'm over the ocean, this altimeter is actually going to drop to zero when I splash down. But if you're over the land, the surface of the land is above sea level and so your altimeter actually won't go to zero when you touch down. And if you're on mountains, it can actually be very high. So it's best not to completely trust the altimeter. What you want to do is look for your shadow if you're coming down over land. Over the water, it's not terribly important, and it's pretty hard to see anyway. So that's my chute fully deploying. And I'm going to go back to time acceleration to speed this up a little bit. And there we go. A safe touchdown for Jebediah Kerman after reaching a stable orbit. Well, I hope that helped, and thanks for watching.